So, um, do you know why my portfolio hasn't done better, Steve? Go on. It's because I don't own any of the top performing stocks in the UK uh, indices, either in the FTSE 100 or the FTSE 250. Do you know why that is, Steve? Is it because you're silly? It's because I absolutely hate them both. (laughs) Um, So the top performing FTSE 100 stock from this year, Steve, is, uh, I guess you probably know because I told you, but it is... Aston Martin. No, that's in the, two. uh, what did I say, 200 or 250 or 100? I don't know, actually, I didn't hear. Okay, well, that's the correct answer if I said 250, Steve. So let's start with the FTSE 250, and I will get my notes on Aston Martin. Um, (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Shares in Aston Martin um, are up and down. So if you own Aston Martin shares uh, and you bought them at the start of this year, you are now 131% up on your investment, um, which is pretty incredible, uh, I think. If you owned it, and much more plausibly to my mind, if you bought Aston Martin shares five years ago, Steve, would you care to guess at what your return has been? Uh, it must be like minus 80% or something. It's pretty close. It's minus 91%. Yes. So, um, if you were busy buying them at the time around the kind of COVID period when they started going uh, low, or just before it, uh, this has been a pretty miserable oh, stock to Five own. years ago, COVID... Yeah, well, it's just before that, right? So Mm. uh, five years ago takes you back just before the COVID thing. Mm. Um, But then it's pretty soon after that. Uh, Mm. uh, So ASML, uh, not ASML, (laughs) Aston Martin, uh, very much the opposite of ASML, um, is a kind of interesting business at the moment. It looks like a pretty miserable investment. I've always thought it was a pretty miserable investment, and I've never never even been tempted to own this stock uh to be honest it has a very low share price but it has a very low share price for a reason even if you like uh double it and add another 30 percent, then you still get to a a pretty low share price but um it's had a rotten history of bankruptcies and takeovers and listings and privatizations and various things in and out and shareholders getting wiped out every 30 seconds but it's been an interesting year uh, for them i mean if you were aston martin um Imagine for the moment then, uh, Steve, I guess one of the things you might try and plausibly do is think, and you made this point to me, what do you have that's valuable here? And the answer is not an awful lot, but you do have a kind of punchy brand. And uh, there is, I think, genuinely something to be said about Aston Martins and James Bond films and and all that kind of um, stuff that goes together. What you're not very good at, it seems, is making cars and then selling them again. So it feels like the natural thing to do, right, would be to try and take your very impressive brand, which is valuable, and then go and find someone who's half decent at making cars, right? I mean, that's what I would do. That's that's, that's exactly what I would do. I would take your brand, license it out to, I don't know, anyone who's good at making cars, who anybody who's good at making luxury cars like BMW or someone like that, and just say, look, we've got the brand power. You make good cars. We want this engine in it. You make all of the other things, and could you try and make us some money for once in a lifetime? I think that's the most sensible thing they could do. Yeah, and they've been doing something approaching that. They've been combining their forces not with BMW or any other sort of obvious big luxury car maker, so uh, not Stellantis, say. Uh, I'm not sure I think of Stellantis as luxury cars, but not Porsche uh, or anyone like that. What they have been combining themselves with is a Chinese company called, I can't pronounce it, but I think it's Geely, uh, G-E-L-E-L-Y, and um, my favourite stock ever, Lucid Motors uh, from the US. So here's the thing with Lucid. What they have is, as I understand it, a pretty impressive car, uh, just no capacity to actually build it, and they're an enormous money sink. They are, um, like Aston Martin, I think, they are Saudi-backed and owned and therefore unlikely to run out of money for no other reason than... They have an endless supply of it coming from their uh, their private backer. But pairing yourself up with Lucid uh, and trying to get their battery tech and EV capacities and so on and preparing an electric um, Aston Martin for either later this year or next year, I think, is the thing that's got people excited. They're signing deals with things. They're trying to get themselves into a position where they can produce an electric vehicle and if they can produce a good one with say lucid's chassis uh and lucid's um equipment and so on and aston martin's branding and probably aesthetics i could imagine that selling steve i think it just needs to be a lucid with an aston martin badge on it steve i think that would be kind of what i think yeah yeah, that would be that would be all it needs to do i don't think aston martin are particularly interested in making evs but if you wanted to the lucid's not bad it's got all of the sort of things that 
um, that that you you want in a car. It's got a lot of proprietary tech. The guy who makes it, I think it's called Pete Rawlinson, the guy who's in who does the design. He was from Tesla. He was behind the Model S. The Model S, I guess, on the face of it, looks a bit Aston Martiny, uh, with with a, a lot less of uh, a lot less price. So, yeah, I think that's probably a really sensible uh, sensible move for them, to be honest. Hmm. So Lawrence Stroll, who owns this, uh, or owns, I think is the largest shareholder in this company. I don't think he's a majority shareholder, but I think he owns the largest number of shares of anybody. Uh, Also said that they've had a pretty good, or they are currently having a pretty good F1 season. I think they're running about third in the Constructor Championships at the moment, which is helping brand awareness, and he thinks pushing things higher. But uh, strong results from Aston Martin in a way that makes both Steve and I grind our teeth and stare at the five-year chart to feel justified about our existence, I guess. Yeah, to be honest with you though, Steve, I'm always happy to uh, I'm always happy to say congratulations on one year, but you know, look at five years, and I think the precedent for Aston Martin is I think it's gone bust eleven times, or, or you know, had a hasty change of ownership, and it's had many billionaires run it before and uh, lose money, and it's actually had top CEOs from other car companies come and fail at, at making it into a decent brand. Uh, well, a, a, it is a decent brand, but a brand that mm. makes some money. Uh, and I, I would suspect, knowing what I know, that this is just the next billionaire's play thing. And the unfortunate thing in when you run a, a company like you run a football club is uh, eventually people get bored of losing money on something that isn't recreational uh, and you don't get to see your team win every week. So uh, I would assume that eventually Aston Martin just goes down the same well-worn path that Aston Martin has been down. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I I say grinds our teeth. I, I don't feel bad for um, anyone who's done well in this stock, by the way. I hope loads of people bought it six months ago and are now up 130%. Um, it's, I feel about this, it's the money losing thing that has a horrible balance sheet. And I feel about people doing well in this the way I feel about people doing well in small cap biotechs or something. Um, fine, obviously that's going to do better than I'm doing, but I don't think I'm... Uh, particularly have a desire to be in that space it's not like this is more comprehensible to me than than they are uh and they no doubt you can find small biocaps their biotech things i mean they will probably be amongst the best performing stocks pretty much anywhere uh and good luck to the people in them right i don't resent them because they're in a stock that i'm not let's talk about stocks that uh, also i'm not i don't own any of these four uh FTSE things the winners or the losers um but one of them is my pick for the jkr thing and it's going exceptionally badly so jkr had a competition for picking a stock for the rest of the year starting in june so we are one month in and my pick was a company called synthoma uh synthoma had been down quite a lot it's the worst performing FTSE 250 stock it's down about 50 percent from the start of the year uh, and a good amount of that is in the last month, which is not great for me. But I was largely picking a how low can this thing go. It's a chemicals company. One of their chemicals they make is uh, called nitrile, which is used in medical gloves. Medical gloves, of course, were piled up during the pandemic and then mad destocking with the money they got from selling loads and loads of these things uh, to uh, various medical facilities. They decided to go and acquire stuff, um, which was a reasonable idea. But the trouble is now their debt is starting to run out of control and they've been selling down assets to try and deal with it. I feel like in this case, they're going to get to a point where they're going to be a bargain in the style of... um, Rolls Royce, which of course was falling and falling during the pandemic, we'll come back to that stock in a moment because it's our FTSE 100 winner. Uh, but I think there comes a point where this gets too cheap. I don't know where that is quite, but um, this to me looks like a much more interesting kind of investment proposition, Steve. Um, any thoughts on pandemic trends reversing or anything like that? Well, they have to eventually, don't they? Uh, I think that's kind of what we we've seen with all the stocks that have had growth pulled forward. That growth pulled forward. They've stuttered along a little bit, and then they've um, they've started growing again. That's kind of what we've we've seen about um, a lot of things. I can't imagine gloves have the gloves haven't expired it. Uh, well, they must have done because we ran out of them during the COVID pandemic, didn't we? Because we had a load in our stores that were 13, 14 years old and and not replenished. Thank you, David Cameron. Um, so I would guess that eventually this this business has to pick up again. It's something that I think that's the angle that you want to go at here, Steve. You want to. Do you know what? I've got some upstairs, Steve. I will do the research for you. I will find out. I think they are even synthoma gloves, I think, 
to be on it. They may, they may be, but I will check that and I will come to you. If they have an expiry date on Steve, you're going to find out quite quickly how, how quickly those stocks are going to get diminished by use or by expiry. Yeah, in terms of uh, stock and expiry, I think we have some as well that were given to my wife as a key worker during the pandemic as part of a, a kind of broad suite of anything roughly PPE related. I think they do expire, but I think they take quite a while to expire. So I think that's going to be a, uh, a bit of time sitting on that. And if you're sat on debt and with interest rates rising, I wouldn't say, don't worry, my gloves are going to expire in 13 years and I'll pay you back um, then. But... In general, uh, yeah, if you could destroy those gloves for me, that would be helpful and try and bring the kind of inventory of some type of gloves down uh, a bit to try and kick some demand along. That would be be good. I tried using some the other day to change a bike tire uh, as sort of protective gloves and they're too small for my hands, so they're rubbish. But uh, they might be symptomas too. If so, I will throw them all in the bin uh, in a very uneco-friendly move. Yeah, I was going to say, any, any thoughts on what the log burner would do to them? Hmm... Uh, the log burner. I don't think you want to try that. I have a feeling that if if my ones, my, my neighbours ones... don't want me to try that. I was going to say I think they will smell quite badly um, if you uh, you try and set them on fire like that. But uh, let's talk about more positive things, there, and then we can talk about how wrong we were of our predictions for the last uh, part of the show. Paining me some more uh, is the news that Rolls Royce is the FTSE 100's top performing stock year to date. Yep, Rolls Royce. All those people at the Motley Fool were right, eventually. Um, but Steve, would you like to get, take a guess? If you bought Rolls Royce shares at the start of the year, you would be up 48% on your investment, and we'd have to muck about with foreign exchange because it's a UK stock. If you bought it five years ago, Steve, so sort of pre-pandemic again, any idea where you would be on your investment there? So I don't know. I am on the year-to-date chart. I haven't seen the five-year chart, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm going to guess about 80% again. Oh, no. Uh, it's not as bad as that. It's uh, I believe you that you don't know. Uh, it's about 56% uh, on the five-year chart that you'd be down. So you'd been roughly cut in half, having uh, added 50% or so to your thing. Rolls-Royce is... This reflects two things to me. One is that Rolls-Royce is improving since the lessening of pandemic restrictions. That much is pretty clear. And those effects have taken a while to sort of flow through onto the income statement and the balance sheet. But they uh, they are not where they were before um, things from five years ago. They, they've had an interesting uh, year. So start of the year, they get a new CEO in, replacing the CEO who was previously turning around that business. And that makes them sound a bit Aston Martin-like, and to an extent, they kind of are. But in fairness to Warren East, who is the outgoing CEO, I wouldn't much have fancied the job of trying to turn round Rolls-Royce during a pandemic. Uh, I feel like that's that's a tough job made artificially tougher in ways that I guess I probably have some sympathy uh, with, with that as a... Look, that doesn't make you a bad executive, the fact that you didn't manage to turn them around during that. Uh, so they have a CEO called, I think his name is Tufan Ergen Belgic, but I will try not to say it too many times in case I'm getting that horribly wrong. Uh, and he came in in January with a nice rousing motivational speech. Uh, he said to Rolls-Royce employees, we underperform every key competitor. Every investment we make destroys value. Uh, and we are standing on a burning platform. Uh, at which point Paul from Everything Money said, sorry, what was that ticker symbol again? Um, But (laughs) uh, since then, things have been looking up for Rolls-Royce and Paul from Everything Money now thinks it's overvalued, I imagine. Uh, He may be right, but um, they have managed to find 1.3 billion in cost savings, 2 billion in disposals, and that has pushed them into some profitable stuff. Uh, Reported back in February to start off with, they reported 500 million in free cash flow from their continuing operations. Uh, that's uh, well, that's an increase of two billion when they were previously outgoing one and a half billion. 652 million in what they call underlying profit. Uh, what it underlies, I'm not quite sure, but call it profit for the time being. So look, they're back to profitability again. There's a good argument, I think, that says this has nothing to do with the new CEO and is largely the result of uh, stuff that was done before he arrived. But nonetheless, I think he'd probably have you believe otherwise in this situation the main thing that seems to be going for them is just look covid trends have pretty much reversed especially with china's reopening now and their ending of their zero hours um zero hours zero covid uh policy long-haul flights are back in action servicing revenue is back on engines um and uh, that's how rolls royce really makes its money it was hurt quite badly during the pandemic that trend was always going to unwind it has unwound question is where they find themselves now probably without those two similar tailwinds of large amounts of disposals and um a, a decovidization uh theme i suppose 
Yeah, I was going to say that Rolls Royce, though, prior to the pandemic, it's key that people know it wasn't a very good business. Now, whether you blame that on the CEO or whether you blame that on something else, that's up to you. But uh, it, even before COVID, it very rarely made money. Uh, but it has some promising things on the horizon, Steve. I know a lot of people talk about these modular reactors, which they think that people will be able to sell around the world. And I find that quite unlikely because I know the US has its own version. And I would not be surprised if all the other countries are working on modular reactors as well. So... It seems quite unlikely to me that Rolls-Royce will just automatically win on that. It might win in the UK. I believe it's got funding to continue the development of these modular reactors. So uh, that is uh, that is at least interesting. Uh, people, key to remember, who don't know, this does, has nothing to do with Rolls-Royce the car. Uh, that's not included in any of these figures. Rolls-Royce the car is owned by, I think, the Volkswagen Group, isn't it? Or BMW. It's one of the two, anyway. It might even be Mercedes, but it's definitely not owned by uh, Rolls-Royce. In here, you're talking about essentially jet engines, jet engine servicing, and a little bit of modular reactors. Uh, things to do with submarines as well, I think, off the top of my head, Steve. So I don't like this business, Steve. I didn't like it before COVID. I don't like the fact that it's up, but I, uh, I don't know, Steve. It's just not one for me. With my trading hat on, I don't mind the idea that if you could see that an end of COVID was going to come, and I couldn't, uh, you would think, well, look, things aren't going to be worse than uh, this. Obviously, travel demand will pick up from here. That will drive servicing revenues again. The real, uh, I'm not a trader, though, so I worry about things like, what about that massive load of debt that we have? Uh, and that sort of thing. Their balance sheet doesn't seem to be terribly strong. They haven't. Uh, from now, I think the real challenge comes for, for Rolls-Royce to get back to where it was so they have to now try and do it without a pandemic tailwind uh behind them um having previously gone into a headwind and without presumably a whole bunch of asset sales to try and help them along their way they are now as efficient as their or they're now as efficient as they can easily make themselves from here it's the challenging bit and we will see what their new um ceo has in mind uh here apart from just yelling at everybody and telling everyone everything's terrible what was his name again steve uh his name was Good, you can supply something in there for me. Good. <laughs> uh, his name was Tufan Ergen Belgic, I think. Um, but let's go with that and let's talk about something else that I don't think I can pronounce very well. Uh, Steve, the FTSE 100's worst stock. I was writing a piece on this for um, Full UK and I was expressing to Steve my dismay about both of these things because uh, I had a kind of easy idea that I'd write a best and worst of the FTSE 100, FTSE 250 for that and then maybe talk about it on the show a little bit. Um, the trouble is I tried to write it significantly in advance and the FTSE 250 changed at the top twice over. Um, it went from being Aston Martin to being Carnival and I started hammering out some stuff on uh pandemic debt heavy cruise ships still full very nice uh but um stuff uh and then it went back to being aston martin again so we've been the carnival thing but fresnillo is uh, now at the bottom of the FTSE 100's returns year to date that's taken it over from Ocado when um Ocado, i had everything written up nicely on that and said various things about how well it didn't make any money during the damn pandemic why is it going to make any now and so on and then amazon said or that was rumored amazon said we'll have it uh and then it shot up so it made its way off the bottom and then in the week that's just gone by amazon said yeah, we're not having it um and it's lost some of those gains but not all of them it is still Fresnillo at the bottom. So, uh, Fresnillo, stock we haven't um, talked about on the show, I think, and stock that is deceptively difficult to research from my perspective, mostly because nearly every YouTube uh, video I see on it appears to not be in English because it's based in Mexico, uh, and I think they're nearly all in Spanish, the videos that I've seen. I'm only... I'm marginally more confident than I am on the Rolls-Royce CEO that I'm pronouncing this correctly, but the two people I've heard referring to it call it Fresnillo rather than Fresnillo or anything like that. But this is a silver mine, also mines gold in Mexico. And one of the first things that Steve ever told me was that mining stocks are reasonably easy to understand. Look, here's the idea. You get as much of this stuff out of the ground as you can. You do it as cheap as you can. You sell it for as much as you can. You don't control the price. There's a spot price on those things, but you hope it's high, basically. Uh, and there's things you can sort of do. You can dial up and down demand when uh, prices are high and low, but price is largely kind of set for you. Uh, so your job is then to get as much of this stuff out the ground as cheap as you can and then sort of cross your fingers on the price a bit. And Fresnello has been struggling with basically all of that this year from what I can see of it. 
price of silver is down, their volumes of gold they're mining are down, their input costs are up in terms of energy. They've been running into, this is a thing that uh, Steve taught me to look at, um, political issues. They've been running into them. Uh, Mexican government has decided that, no, you can't just use uh, stuff like that or the amount of kind of casual labour they're allowed to use down mines, which has bumped up their wage costs. They've halved their dividends as a result, and they have been struggling with power hookups at two of their mine extensions, including the one called Fresnillo. Uh, so roughly as a result of all of that, the stock is down 33% year to date. Um, Steve, mining companies, they come and they go. When you look down the weaker end of returns here for the FTSE 100, you will also see Glencore, you will also see Anglo-American down there. And I'm not saying they don't have their own individual issues, much like Fresnillo uh, does. The the stuff here is not just generic um, yeah, commodities or mining related issues. But um, any thoughts on, well, any of the FTSE 100's miners? Uh it's strange isn't it it's strange to see like chilean uh, companies and and mexican companies all listed back onto the london stock exchange i suppose that helped harks back to when we were a lot more important stock exchange than we are today but uh with miners generally they've all had pretty good years commodity prices have been strong um and for for a period energy was cheap uh and and thus their um all in sustainable cost which is one of the important metrics for miners all seem to have gone down and now the opposite is true, is that energy costs are quite high. Uh, there's a lot of political pressure out there now to give people a fair wage. Um, um, transport costs uh, went up and then came down. Uh, so all of these are big effects on um, on, the, on the price of these companies because they're all price um, takers, not price makers. So they, they don't have any control over what the thing sells for, which is not a great place to be uh, uh, as a business so i've seen a lot of people talk about glencore and we've talked about glencore here Stephen. as i've regularly said to you when times get tough glencore goes to about adp and that's probably the time to buy it. even though they look uh, really really cheap at the moment you've got to remember that the metrics that you're looking at are likely backwards looking metrics and backward was all of the good and forward could be all of the bad so um, even though these have fallen quite a bit, and looking at Fresnillo, it's it has fallen quite a bit, but it's it's no way off. It's uh, nowhere near its its actual bottom or anything like that. So uh, that's what I would wait for, Steve. To be honest, it can be the oldest silver mine in the world, which is what I'm reading now on their website. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can be the second largest gold miner in Mexico, but it doesn't matter. It's still pretty. It's still decently priced at the moment. Yeah, still decently priced. If you bought the stock five years ago, you'd be down even more than you currently are, even including the dividends that you would have got back. Um, but it's an interesting one. Silver mining isn't uh, something I've ever really got uh, much of an eye on. I preferred sort of industrial use um, metals. But um, there's some interesting stuff going on in the gold mine, silver mining space. We might talk about that in uh, some future episodes. 